On October 19, 1987, the stock market crashed. Called Black Monday, October 19 refers to the day where the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 20% of its value. And at that point, it was the largest single day drop in modern history. Most people didn't see it coming. Before the crash, a one widely cited statistic was that an event of this magnitude was expected to happen about once every several billion, billion years. Crash, stock market crashes are events that should never happen, never. And yet they happen all of the time. In 1987, in 1997, in 2000, in 2001, in 2007. And these events beg the question, why can't we predict stock market crashes? Is there something in their nature that makes them inherently unpredictable? So this is a talk about stock market crashes, but it's also a talk about us as a university and about us as students. This is a mathematician named Ben O. Oh. You know what? That's fine. It was a picture of a mathematician named Benoit Mandelbrot. <laughs> he was a mathematician who worked at IBM in the 1960s, and he was studying cotton price trading, or, or cotton trading. Um, and over time, he sort of had this idea that stock markets are governed by two different forces. The first uh, is that of an effect called the Joseph effect. They're both named after biblical stories. So the Joseph effect refers to a story from the Bible where Joseph was a Hebrew slave, and he was asked to interpret a dream that the Pharaoh had. And he interpreted this dream as a prophecy, that Egypt was going to have seven years of prosperity, and that was going to be followed by seven years of famine. And this came to pass. So the Joseph effect refers to time of predictable change, refers to gradual and continuous change in the stock markets. And this is the effect that we see governing the markets most of the time. The second effect is that of the Noah effect. So this refers to a story in the Bible of the, it's okay. It, we, it's, you know what? We're fine. We don't need these. This refers to the story of Noah. And so Noah was 600 years old when um, there was a great and terrible flood. But luckily he was able to build an ark to withstand the flood. So the Noah effect refers to times of extreme cataclysmic change. Things that we can't see coming. And an author named Nassim Taleb referred to these events that we can't see coming, but which have huge consequences as black swans. So the study of economics has to assume that the future is going to be predictable and that the future is going to be sort of like average, right? It doesn't have a lot of room for black swans. But the problem with this approach um, and with the sort of the approach that we're taught, like really it's fine, let's not, let's not use it. <laughs> this is a black swan. <laughs> So what we're taught here at St. Andrews and what we're taught in business schools across the globe is that the best way to manage an investment portfolio, necessarily we have to have some idea of financial risk. We have to have some measure of this risk. But the problem is that to get that measure, we have to make a few assumptions. We have to assume that most price changes in the stock market are pretty small and incremental and there aren't huge swings either up or down, so there aren't crashes. This assumption is false. And we've known that it's been wrong for, for quite a lot of time. Um, but this assumption isn't wrong in, in every area. It actually does a really good job of explaining things from like sort of the biological world. So if you think of human height, most humans don't differ very much in their height. Um, and we don't see people who are like 50 feet tall walking around. So this is an area of mild variability. And, and we can make sort of predict predictions in this area. But the market is a very different area. It's an area based on wild randomness, where we have black swans, where we have crashes. And this doesn't lend itself to tools from the, the area of mild randomness. So if we know this assumption is wrong, like what are other options of thinking about, um, of thinking about stock markets? Well, when Benoit Mandelbrot was working at IBM, he noticed something. He noticed that all pricing charts look the same. So it's really hard to tell on first glance whether an unlabeled chart refers to sort of five days trading or a year's trading. And unless you're told before, it's, it's basically impossible. So pricing charts are items which are self-similar. They're items which um, sort of, the, the part re resembles the whole. And items that are self-similar are referred to as fractals. So this is a mathematical concept, but also like fractals just occur everywhere in nature. So if you take a head of broccoli, and cut off a branch of that head, that branch looks like the whole pattern. It looks like another head of broccoli. So fractals are items that it doesn't matter 
what scale you view broccoli on, it's gonna look like the same pattern. As a really weird side note, my mom sends me recipe cards because she doesn't think that I eat well enough. I was writing my notes on a recipe card this morning and I realized that the recipe on this is for broccoli salad. <laughs> so hopefully I'll have that tonight, maybe sometime after the speaker's dinner. I thought that was really funny, so thanks mom. <laughs> um, so basically, Nassim or Benoit Mandelbrot was able to use this idea of fractals in, in building a different understanding of how stock markets move. He said, okay, well, we have these uh, areas of small incremental change, right, the Joseph effect, but we also have to incorporate these areas of huge change, such as the NOAA effect. Um, and so in doing this, he, he, d he made this model that describes price movements really well. It's able to mimic price movements. Um, and it does, it, it does this by taking stock market crashes not as like outliers or as just exceptions to the rule, but as, as the norm of what happens in areas of wild variability. This model has one pretty big drawback. Um, it doesn't lend itself to the notion of quantifying risk in the way that we're used to, in the way that we are, we've been taught to sort of rely on. What it does a really good job of, do, uh, of sort of telling us, um, it gives us a robust method of determining how vulnerable a portfolio would be to extreme crashes, crashes that like maybe we can't even imagine that we haven't even seen before, not just crashes that have occurred in the past. But it doesn't tell us how to predict changes, and that's really scary to a lot of people. What it does tell us is we should be more resilient to crashes, like us just as people, but also like investment portfolios, we, um, like banks, they ought to be more resilient to crashes. The financial industry relies on having answers, and it relies on this idea that we can quantify risk. And so to take away this, this the way that we think about finance is, is, to, is really scary. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're sort of trying to like get around New York City by using a map of Chicago O'Hare Airport. <laughs> like it's never really gonna help us find anything. But at least a lot of people say like, at least we have a map, at least we have some sort of answer. And they say that maybe we should continue to use this mild market, you know, like this, this Joseph understanding of the market and sort of like tweak it um, until, it, you know, it more or less represents reality. But treating the market as mild and treating it as wild are two fundamentally different approaches to the market. And I don't think that we should use the wrong map to try to get around New York City. But like, who am I to make these extreme claims to not even be able to work like the PowerPoint? <laughs> um, well, I'm a student here. I'm in my fourth year of economics and math. And next year, I'm going to be working in the risk department at a bank. And a lot of my peers here at St. Andrews and everywhere else are gonna do the similar thing. Around 20% of Ivy League graduates every single year go into finance, regardless of their degree discipline. And what's being emphasized in our economics and finance lectures isn't so much whether or not the models we use are true, but how proficient we are at using them because this is what our employers require of us, so it makes sense. But the financial industry is a culture that's dominated and sort of controlled by the idea that we can find the Empire State Building in Chicago O'Hare Airport. And as Benoit Mandelbrot once said, it's sometimes when exactitude is elusive, it's better to be approximately right than certifiably wrong. I believe that St. Andrews and universities around the world are unique and their ability to change the culture of finance simply because so many future financiers go here. Like I'm probably looking at the vice presidents of banks, you know, in 10 times, like, like in 10 years right now. Um, and I think that us as students should feel a responsibility to examine the models that we're using with a more critical eye. And so I think that we what we should take away from university and what should be taught in university is an appreciation of markets which are wild, of both calm waters and floods, not to rely on what is comfortable, but what is true. Thank you.